In the early morning hours of September the 10th, 27-year-old Hamida Jandobi was awoken by the sound of jangling keys and whispers of a name every condemned prisoner dreaded. The man from Paris is here. Prison guards then entered his cell and began the traditional condemned toilet. Jandobi was dressed in a red sweater, the collar cut low with scissors to expose his neck. His hands and feet were bound with cords, and he was offered a final cigarette. Stalling for time, he smoked one, then another but was denied a third. After knocking back a final shot of rum, he was led out of his cell and down the prison corridors, the floors padded with blankets to muffle his footsteps. He soon emerged into the prison courtyard, where the guillotine stood waiting, its blade glinting in the floodlights. The end came swiftly and efficiently. Jandobi was thrown onto the guillotine's tilting bascule board, a wooden collar was snapped around his neck, and the executioner pressed a button, releasing the falling blade. Within seconds, Jandobi was dead, his severed head tumbling into a wicker basket at the base of the machine. While this might sound like an episode out of 1700s revolutionary France, this scene actually took place in the year 1977, less than five months after the first Star Wars movie debuted in theaters. It was the end of a long and bloody era, for on that day, Hamid Jandobi became the last person in France and the Western world to face justice at the hands of the National Razor. While inextricably associated with the French Revolution in 1789 to 1799, the concept of the guillotine is in fact considerably older. Ancient Romans developed a device known as the manaya, consisting of a pillory-like contraption into which the condemned's head was clamped. A blade was inserted into a slot in the top and hammered down with a mallet to sever the victim's head. Starting in the 13th century, a device closely resembling a modern guillotine was used for executions in the English town of Halifax, Yorkshire. The Halifax gibbet, as it was known, sported a pair of wooden upright and a vertically falling blade, though the blade itself took the form of a curved axe head and removed the victim's head more through blunt trauma than clean slice. Similar devices were recorded in 14th century Ireland and 16th to 18th century Scotland, where it was known as the Maiden. For much of history, however, such contraptions were the exception to the rule. The vast majority of executions were carried out by hand, with the method of execution depending on the condemned social class. Commoners were made to strangle slowly at the end of a hangman's rope, or subjected to the breaking wheel, in which the condemned was tied to a frame and their bones broken with an iron bar. Nobles, by contrast, were beheaded with an axe or a sword, with the family of the condemned often paying extra to ensure that the blade was sharp and the execution swift and painless. In France, this state of affairs persisted until the late 18th century and the reign of King Louis XVI. In 1788, amid rising revolutionary sentiment across the country, a blacksmith named Mature Luchard was murdered by his son, Jean. The elder Luchard, a staunch traditionalist and royalist, disapproved of his son's egalitarian ideals and planned to marry his girlfriend, Helen, to teach him a lesson. One night, Jean snuck into his father's house to rescue Helen, only to be caught by Maturin. A struggle ensued, during which Jean struck Maturin in the head with a hammer, killing him instantly. Despite pleading self-defense, Jean Luchard was convicted and sentenced to death on the breaking wheel. But as he was being led to his execution, the crowd, seeing Luchard as a martyr for revolutionary ideals, seized him and carried him to safety. Moved by this dramatic show of popular will, King Louis granted Luchard a royal pardon and banned the use of the breaking wheel in France. Alas, this act of mercy did little to secure Louis's grip on power, for a year later revolution broke out, and in 1791 the French monarchy was overthrown. The Revolutionary National Assembly sought to reform nearly every aspect of French life under the Ancien Regime, or Old Order, including the practice of capital punishment. On the 10th of October 1789, physician Joseph Ignace Guillotin proposed to the Assembly that a more humane form of execution be developed, one which would be used on all condemned criminals regardless of social class. Such a device would align with the revolutions of liberty, equality, and fraternity, and the Enlightenment era notion that the purpose of capital punishment was simply to end life rather than to inflict unnecessary pain. To carry out the deed, Guillotin proposed a device similar to the Halifax gibbet and the maiden, which would sever the condemned's head, quote, in the twinkling of an eye, and you never feel it. While many of his fellow revolutionaries failed to take Guillotin's suggestions seriously, his ideas struck enough of a chord that in October 1791 the Assembly passed a law making decapitation the sole method of legal execution in France and formed a special committee to determine the best possible mechanism. Contrary to popular belief, Guillotin did not design or build the machine that would eventually come to bear his name. That honor belongs to Dr. Antoine Louis, physician to the King and Secretary of the Academy of Surgery. Louis's design featured a number of improvements over previous falling blade devices 
including a tilting basketball board to which the victim could be strapped, a sliding wooden collar or lunette to secure the victim's neck, and an angled rather than a straight or curved blade to ensure a cleaner cut. Ironically, according to legends, the latter feature was suggested by none other than King Louis himself, who, among other things, was an avid amateur locksmith and enthusiast for all things mechanical. A prototype execution machine was constructed by German harpsichord maker Tobias Schmidt, and on April 17, 1792, Dr. Louis and a group of government officials gathered at the B-Set Hospital to put the new machine through its paces. Over the course of the day, bundles of hay, sheep, and several human corpses were subjected to the falling blade. The results were impressive, and the device was approved as France's standard method of execution. Though initially dubbed the Lucette after its actual inventor, the machine soon became known as the guillotine. The guillotine made its public debut on April 25, 1792, when it was used to execute the notorious highwayman Nicolas Jacques Peltier. While the machine worked as advertised, the crowd that gathered to watch Peltier's death came away disappointed. For many, the newfangled method of execution was too quick and efficient, lacking the drama and macabre spectacle of hanging or the breaking wheel. But there would soon be more than enough drama to go around as the use of the guillotine soon ramped up to terrifying proportions. During the reign of terror of 1793 to 1794, when individuals suspected of harboring anti-revolutionary sentiments were rounded up and condemned by the thousands, over 16,500 people were subjected to the National Razor or People's Avenger, most famously King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette. The man tasked with carrying out many of these beheadings was Charles-Henri Sanson, the chief executioner under the old regime. Like many in his peculiar trade, Sanson came from a long line of executioners and not necessarily by choice. For much of history, executioners, known by the derogatory term bourreau, occupied a controversial position in French society, despised, shunned, and denied many of the rights of their fellow citizens. For while they performed their grim duty under the legal authority of the state, executioners were nonetheless seen as tainted killers, with an old superstition holding that anything touched by an executioner was also touched by the devil himself. Due to this prejudice, executioners were forced to live on the outskirts of town, schools refused to teach their children, bakers kept their bread separate, and the churches refused to marry them, except into the families of other executioners. Thus, by the 20th century, most of the executioners in France could trace their lineage back to only a handful of families. One of the few exceptions to this rule was Samson, who, thanks to his key role in dispatching the enemies of the revolution, was hailed as a national hero and the avenger of the people. His typical work uniform, consisting of striped trousers, a tricorn hat, and a green coat, became a popular men's fashion trend, while women wore tiny, guillotine-shaped earrings and brooches. The end of the terror brought a sharp reduction in the number of guillotinings, but the timbers of justice would remain France's standard method of execution for another two centuries. The guillotine was adopted by a number of other countries, including Belgium, Switzerland, Greece, Sweden, and Germany, where it was used well into the Nazi era. Between 1933 and 1945, the Third Reich beheaded nearly 16,500 prisoners, the most famous of which was 22-year-old Sophie Scholl, a member of the White Rose Nonviolent Student Resistance Group. Arrested on February 18, 1943, for distributing anti-government pamphlets at the University of Munich, Scholl was subjected to a show trial before the Volksgerichtshof, or People's Court, convicted of treason and beheaded on February the 23rd at the Stahlheim prison. The guillotine was last used in West Germany in 1949 and East Germany in 1966, before being replaced by hanging and the firing squad. In its country of origin, however, the National Razor carried on its grim work, though no longer with the carnival atmosphere that typified early executions. The last public guillotining in France was carried out on June the 17th, 1939, on Eugen Weidmann, a German convict who, along with two accomplices, kidnapped, robbed, and murdered six wealthy tourists in Paris. Weidmann's execution, carried out in front of Saint-Pierre prison in Versailles, was witnessed by then 17-year-old British actor Christopher Lee, who later described the scene that followed. They rushed Weidman to the extraordinary structure so that his feet came off the ground. His hands were tied behind him and his head was held back. They set him down by the plank and punched him in the stomach so that he fell forwards onto it. A strap went over his back. The plank tilted forward. In that instance, the knife fell, and I thought I would die myself. A powerful wave of howling and shrieking broke out from the crowd. Some rushed to the corpse and did not hesitate to soak handkerchiefs and scarves in the blood spread on the pavement as a souvenir. Disgusted by the crowd's hysterical behavior, French President Albert Lebrun declared that all future executions would be carried out behind prison walls out of view of the public. Only prison guards, the condemned lawyers, and the prison chaplain would be allowed to witness the grisly spectacle. Between 1959 and 1977, France guillotined 32 men, including many members of the OAS, a right-wing terrorist organization who sought to assassinate President Charles de Gaulle for granting independence to France's former colony of Algeria. Over time, however, shifting public opinion led to the death 
death penalty being handed down less and less often, with guillotine being reserved for only the most heinous crimes. The last three executions in French history took place in the mid-1970s, beginning with that of Christian Renucci, a 22-year-old door-to-door salesman who, on June 3, 1974, kidnapped and beat to death 8-year-old Marie Dolores Rambler outside Marseille. Despite being a staunch opponent of the death penalty, French President Valéry Giscard d'Estaing refused to grant a stay of execution, and Renucci was beheaded in Marseille's Beaumont prison on July 28, 1976. Renucci's case was followed by that of 34-year-old Jerome Henri Carrier, who, on October 27, 1975, raped, strangled, and drowned 8-year-old Catherine Petit in the village of Arlou. Like Renucci, he was denied a stay of execution, and he met his end by the guillotine's blade in Douai prison on June 23, 1977. And then came the case of Hamida Jandobi. Born on September 22, 1949, in France's then colony of Tunisia, North Africa, Jandobi moved to Marseille in 1968, where he worked in a grocery store. He later became an agricultural laborer and a landscaper, but in 1971, he suffered an accident in which his right leg became caught in the tracks of a tractor, resulting in most of the limb having to be amputated. While recovering in hospital, Jandobi met 19-year-old Elizabeth Bousquet, and the two soon became a couple. However, Jandobi quickly became aggressive and tried to force Bousquet into prostitution, causing her to file a police report against him in 1973. Jandobi was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to 11 months in jail. Upon his release, Jandobi gained the confidence of two 15-year-old girls and forced them into prostitution. Then, on July 3, 1974, Jandobi kidnapped Bousquet, drove her to his home, and proceeded to violently beat and burn her with cigarettes in front of the other girls. When the beating did not kill Bousquet, Jandobi drove her to the outskirts of town, where he strangled her to death. As he later testified during his trial, I put the scarf around her neck, and she didn't struggle when I began to choke her. I choked her for a few minutes, and then I asked for the flashlight so I could make sure she was really dead. At one point, for reasons I can't really explain, I kicked the girl's nose, but she didn't move. Upon returning to the house, Jandobi warns the other girls not to tell anyone what they had seen, lest they suffer the same fate. Four days later, a young boy discovered Elizabeth Bousquet's body hidden in a shed near the site of her strangling, while in August, Jandobi attempted to kidnap another 15-year-old girl. This time, however, the girl managed to escape and report her abduction to the police, resulting in Jandobi's arrest. The trial of Hamida Jandobi dragged on for nearly four years. Though Jandobi confessed to the murder of Elizabeth Bousquet, his lawyers argued that he was not responsible for his actions. Jandobi's 1971 amputation they claimed had driven him into a spiral of alcoholism and violent behavior, such that he was no longer the same man that he'd been before the accident. Therefore, they argued Jandobi should be found not guilty by reason of insanity and committed to a psychiatric institution. As one of his lawyers declared, we've already cut off his leg. We are not also going to cut off his head. However, a psychiatrist acting as an expert witness for the prosecution testified that Jandobi possessed a higher-than-average intelligence and posed a colossal danger to society. The jury agreed, and on February 25, 1977, Jandobi was found guilty of torture, murder, rape, and premeditated violence against three minors and sentenced to death. Jandobi's lawyers appealed twice for clemency without success, while once again President Destain refused to grant a stay of execution. Jandobi's execution on September 10 took place at 4.40 a.m. under the supervision vision of Marcel Chevalier, France's chief executioner. In 1870, the multiple regional executioners previously employed across the country were replaced by an executioner of high works who was required by law to reside in Paris. The same law also outlawed the old slur Barreau, making it a crime to refer to anyone by that name. Instead, the arrival of the chief executioner was announced with the sinister euphemism, the man from Paris is here. But following Jandobi's execution, Chevalier's curious occupation also faded into history. On October 9, 1981, shortly after the election of President François Mitterrand, the death penalty was abolished in France. This abolition would be enshrined into the French Constitution in 2007 in an amendment guaranteeing that no French citizen would ever be put to death again. After nearly 200 bloody years, the National Razor had made its final cut. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. Before you leave, let me tell you about a new channel that I'm doing called Into the Shadows. So maybe the world isn't dark enough for you. Well, good news, it absolutely is. And if you'd like to know more about the horrible things that humans have been doing to each other since, well, time immemorial, well, please check out that new channel, Into the Shadows. From landmines to penal colonies to horrific diseases, if it's horrific, we cover it. Check it out through the link in the description below. Again, it's called Into the Shadows, and thank you for watching.